Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in again. And today I sit down with Sofiane Sahili, the ultra endurance rider from France. Sofiane is an exceptional athlete and a really good human being. Uh, Sofiane and I chat about what he does for a living, some training techniques, the new bike deal that he just got, as well as some other things, including uh, doping among the ultra endurance world. It's a really great conversation. I hope you enjoy it. And if you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the comment section below. I'm sure myself or Sofian will be able to answer those for you. Enjoy. Sofian, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, first off, where what's going on? Where are you right now? Uh, how are you uh, dealing with the, uh, the global pandemic currently? I am uh, in the countryside. I'm in uh, Normandy, west of France. So it's about 200K from where I live, which is... Uh, Paris, France, yep. and uh, I've been there since a, a, a bit more than two weeks now because we've been in lockdown. Uh, we've been in lockdown uh, since uh, March 16th, okay. and that's when I got to the got to the countryside and uh, and decided to to spend uh, uh, pretty much all of the lockdown somewhere where it's nice, when I can be outside and not in a cramped up small apartment in Paris. And uh, yeah, it's a, I think it's a good move. Yeah. Oh, for sure. So are they are they restricting like freedom of movement within um, Paris or can you still kind of go walk around? It's just a lot of the essential services are closed down. Um, they are restricting movement um, pretty much uh, everywhere in France. Actually, you can you can go for a walk as long as it's not um, more than uh, like 500 miles, uh, 500, uh, sorry, half a mile. Right. OK. From your house, right. half a mile from your house, and uh, once a day, and also you can go grocery shopping. You're supposed, you know, to go once in a while, not right. not too often, not every day, and uh, yeah, you can you can go jogging. If that's what you do. But again, it used to be at the fr at first it was there was a ten two kilometer radius, and now it's one kilometer, and um, and every time you go out, you have to fill a form. Saying oh, wow. uh, where you live, what oh. time you went out, where you're going, what you're doing. Are you going out to get groceries? Are you going out to 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 run or or cycle stuff like that? And yeah. uh, so that's and they they do enforce it, and you do get fined if you don't have a form or if there's no justification to you going out. That's that's pretty intensive. That is pretty strict. Yeah. Is France faring all right? As far as uh, number of confirmed cases and whatnot, I think it's it's um, last last uh, night the, the the count for uh, yesterday was uh, 500 deaths, and um, it seems to be growing still, and they're hoping that it will stop growing in uh, maybe uh, a week or something like that. So it's not it's not terrible like Italy is. But it's not good. So I've always been curious. So you you were born and raised in France, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. You were born in suburb. Paris? Or? Yes. I was born in, in uh, Kishu, which is a small suburb really close from Paris. And I grew up not far away from there. And I still, I still live, uh, you know, in the same, uh, not neighborhood, but in the okay. same suburb. How are you so good at English? <laughs> I don't know. I just picked it up, I guess. I mean, some people are... Good with language, I think it's it's a memory thing. As long okay. as you can memorize uh, without any effort, the way that the words sound, it just gets into my head, and, and then it's, I'm just able to to you know speak it effortlessly, I guess. Because you're really like really good at it, um, which is <laughs> yeah. which is pretty awesome. Uh, do you use English in your like daily life for like work, and so you do messenger work, right? Not really, no. Okay. No, I do not use English in my in my daily life as a messenger. I'm, I'm, I speak French uh, pretty much all day. Got it. And but so, I do. And what is do what, what kind of what kind of messaging stuff do you do? Mail messenger, or is it is it more extensive than that? It's it's a bit more extensive. Uh, I work with a company that works a lot with uh, uh, fashion. Obviously, in Paris, there's a lot of big luxury fashion retail store. Yep. And also a lot of uh, department store, and uh, we do cater to these uh, these companies a lot. But we also I, I end up uh, 
transporting things like uh, handbags, shoes, oh, cool. dresses, stuff like that. But also, you know, we work with uh, with uh, movie companies, uh, transporting mo- movies like on on uh, on hard drives from uh, from a company to to cinema, stuff like that, and uh, lawyer lawyer firms as well for documents and all sorts of things. Just I don't do food. We right. do not deliver food, but right. we deliver pretty much everything else. Um, how long have you been doing that? And is that kind of was that your segue into doing these longer rides? Actually, it, it's it's the opposite. I started with bike touring in okay. in um, 2010 and did it a lot for a couple of years. And I went back to Paris and I wanted to so I, I discovered cycling via bike touring. I used to be I used to commute with my bike and go to work with my bike, but that's pretty much uh, all I did with my bike. And then I discovered bike touring, and then I knew that I wanted to I wanted to be on my bike way more, mm-hmm. and uh, that was that was pretty much the only option for me if I wanted to first off work outside and and, and be outside for most of the day, and then uh, and then spend most of my time on the bike. Yeah. So I. Became a messenger in uh, actually 2013, and um, so yeah, it's been seven years now. Time flies. Yeah, that's awesome. Can you recount your first uh, bike tour trip? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, so it was um, 2010. It was December uh, of 2010, and uh, it was not originally a bike tour. I actually just went to Thailand with a backpack. And then I started traveling around uh, on buses, trains, taxis, uh, all sorts of, uh, of transportation. And after about 10 days, I ended up, I was somewhere in the in northern Laos, uh, real close to the Chinese border. And, and that, that Southeast Asia trip that I had, that I had been dreaming about for, for so long, I, I felt that it was not what I had hoped for. And that I needed to make a change, and I was in that small town in Laos, and I um, I went to uh, actually a, a bike rental store, and um, I rented a bike for about three days, and I just cycled about uh, I don't know forty miles to a village, stayed there, and then uh, for two days cycled around, and then went back, and uh, I was hooked. I was just hooked, and this, what started as just you know backpacking became uh, cycle touring, and, mm-hmm. and and I loved it instantly, and it's, it was just uh, it was just what I was craving, and the adventure that I was looking for, um, and not finding when I was just a, a pedestrian with my backpack, I I actually found it when I got on the bike. That's special when that just randomly happens like that. You just recently signed a new contract with Bomb Track, which is a uh, a bike brand. Where can you explain Bomb Track a little bit? Their catalog and um, and why you decided on joining uh, joining with them. Bomb Track is a German manufacturer of bikes. It's a it's a smaller company, but they have a, a very large uh, uh, offer. In terms of uh, what kind of bike you can get with them, and they are uh, adventure oriented. That's that's, and also they're really cool guys because yeah. they um, there's four founders and two of them uh, used to be bike messengers. So obviously, when they contacted me, I was like, "Wow, that's cool." I, I mean, bike messengers. It's like this big this big family all over the world. Sure. When 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 you meet. Uh, uh, where, wherever I am, the world when I meet a bike messenger, I feel like it's a, it's a it's a brother, you know, it's yep. a, it's mm-hmm. a colleague, even if I don't know him. And um, so it's it's yeah, a smaller company. Uh, and I first heard of uh, of uh, Bomb Track because they have uh, actually a French rider in their team, which is a two-time transcontinental veteran and also a two-time Highland Trail 550 veteran. Oh wow! And, uh, uh, yeah, you know him. Yeah, yeah what's his, him. what? What? what uh, do you remember his name? I I'm drawing a blank. Clément. Yeah, Clément, Clément Saviki. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Said, yeah. I mean, he, he visited me not too long ago. We talked about you actually. Yeah. Oh, cool. He's a good dude. And uh, yeah, he is. And uh, yeah, so 
I, I um, heard about Bomb Track from him at first when he joined when he joined them, and then they really caught my eye when they introduced the uh, the hook. Uh, okay. The, the bike, actually yeah. the hook X uh, Carbon, which is which is like a, a, I guess what we call a monster cross now. So it's basically a, a gravel bike. Uh, but with mountain bike tires. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what's and the clearance all sorts on of that? Mounts. Um, if you if you mount if you uh, build it with uh, twenty seven point five inches uh, wheels, you can go as far as two to five, I guess. Okay. And I think you can go. You can have on it with twenty nine or wheels. You can go two inches, I guess. Okay. Cool. That's great. And it's just yeah, it's just yeah, that's just. Uh, great bike and I, I remember looking at it it was like oh wow that's a cool bike and a friend of mine uh that lives in switzerland has it and i visited him and i was i was able to to actually uh, uh try it out and i loved it and then um and then yeah bomb track got in touch and we we hit it out instantly cool. and I was like, okay this is this is there's several things you know when you when you join a brand and and there's the products of course what kind of products they have is it products that you want you you want to use and also there's the people Yep. Is it people you want to work with? And it's definitely people that I want to work with and products that I want to use. Yeah. And I remember talking to you, oh, it was probably, it was a few years ago and you were, you were struggling to like find a, like a good fit with somebody. Um, and were you, were you actively like looking around for a contract like this or did it just, was it just a perfect, perfect, you know, uh, situation that just popped up? I. I uh, I was not really looking around for for uh, actively for uh, uh, partners uh, as far and sponsoring as far as my my racing goes because it's not something that I like to do actually I know some people will go out and send a lot of uh, a lot of emails and, and yep. have uh, really good dossiers that you you can actually send out to friends and, and, and sound real interesting and stuff like that and it's not some I like to ride my bike so this yep. is what I do. And it, it, as it happens, last year was really good for me. I raced uh, three races and I won two. And uh, I was on the Tour de Vine and I did not win this one, obviously. But I kind of made a splash mm -hmm. by uh, riding ahead of uh, Mike Hall's record yep. for about a week. So it was a year where I started getting noticed. And when you when you get noticed by people, you will see get noticed by brands and and. I started having more opportunities, and then with uh, with my recent win on the Atlas Mountain Race, um, it became easier for me just to 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 find partners. And but actually, Bomb Track got in touch with me before the Atlas Mountain Race. Okay. Uh -huh. Not you know in time to have a Bomb Track bike on the race, but right. Yeah. We started talking before the race. Cool. But yeah, I was it was it. I always told myself, well, I don't want to. Go out and start, you know, looking for brands. And maybe if I if I do my thing and I, and I do it right and, and I and I win the races, they will come, and that's what happened. Awesome, um, yeah. And just kind of to chat about those races, I know that you've chatted about them in other podcasts, so I don't want to spend too much time on them. But um, I guess last year it was a huge year for you. It, it, at least for me, as being an outsider looking at your accomplishments. That's pretty incredible, um, and even still with like the Tour Divide, like that just after Brush Mountain, that was a very unfortunate circumstance for a lot of people. Um, but yeah, what I you did the Inca Divide, you did what were the races you did, and um, nice, nice. and uh, what were what positions did you get in those? So I started with Italy Divide, which is what, which was in uh, in. End of April, beginning of May in Italy, obviously, yeah. and I uh, I ranked first, tied with James Hyden. Okay. And then uh, then was uh, Tour Divide in June, where uh, as I as I said before, I was the head of Mike's record for uh, for quite a bit of time, and then ended up dropping out uh, a little bit after Brush Mountain Lodge, after spending a night that was pretty scary up there in a snowstorm. And then I did Inca Divide in August, and uh, I finished first. I won it. Uh, with about I don't know, 24 hours on the on the guy that finished second. So that was that was a good year. That was a really good year. Sweet, yeah. And that Inca Divide race looks pretty pretty epic with the all the the high altitude. Like you think that Tour Divide's high? No way. 
Nah, nah, <laughs> total virus. Nah. <laughs> well, well, yeah, it kind of is, 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 is pretty, pretty amazing and epic. You go as high as 16,000 feet, actually. That's yeah. 5,000 meters. That's how right. high you go. And, and, I, I, I trained for this. I was I was definitely ready for this. Yeah. I uh, I spent about uh, uh, a month in Colombia, uh, yeah. climbing at altitudes that were close to this, like twelve to fourteen thousand feet, and spending a lot of time at, at a, a little bit elevation, mm-hmm. and, and trying to make sure that I would get to the Incaribe and not get altitude sickness. Uh, yeah. it, it's something that you need to train for because altitude sickness it can it can actually happen to anybody, no matter how strong you are. Uh, Luis Sador, who won the the Tour de Vide in 2017, which is a really super strong rider, got it on the on the CTR this year. Oh yeah. So it can really, yeah. So it can really happen to anybody, and you, and, and I I actually t- told myself I want to do this right. I want to get on the kind of ride and be prepared. And and I cycled a lot in Colombia. And um, I managed to get there. And when you when you're up there at sixteen thousand feet, five thousand meters, uh, it's it's a story that I uh, often tell. But just just actually removing my gloves, I was I was just removing my gloves like that, mm-hmm. and it would get me out of breath. Right. Just such a small effort as as because there's just so little oxygen, mm-hmm. and it it really is an epic race. It's it's really I mean you. You see places that you can't see anywhere else. You see yeah. some of the most beautiful canyons that you can imagine, and, and you get places that you can't you can't even dream of. And, and that was that was definitely one of the most spectacular races as far as a scenery goes that I, that I've ever done. Normally, what what is your training plan before a big ultra race? Like how long? How many months out does it go? Um, and yeah, what kind of training regimen are you following, if any at all? Well, as a bike messenger, I'm I'm on my bike pretty much every day. I'm on my bike five times a week, and that's uh, that's uh, that's really good training because you 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 go all out for about half a day. It's not long rides; it's about sixty, maybe seventy k's, which is like I don't know forty miles every day. Uh, but it's 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 intense, so it gives me good conditioning. And when, like for example, for the Atlas Mountain Race, I um, I would I would you know go to work every day, obviously, and then I would ride on the weekend. Uh, I would go on long rides with not a lot of intensity. Yeah. Uh, just just maybe I don't know 100, uh, 100, 130 miles, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, one on Saturday, one on Sunday, low intensity, but just to make sure I was comfortable on the bike. Yep. And then as it as it got closer, I went on a on a solo uh, kind of week long uh, bike packing trip, and uh, it was I think it was seven hundred maybe six hundred miles uh, with long rides, then shorter ones with a bit more intensity, and then I, I uh, capped it with a really long one uh, going as fast as I could, and just to make sure that uh, actually the goal for me was to finish with a long ride because I just wanted to be sure that uh, even with the, the, the fatigue that I had built up from the 500 miles of the previous day, my body would still be able to, to go quite hard for uh, 200 miles or so. Right. That's awesome. Yeah, and that's that's the goal, right? That's what you want. You want yeah. that body to get used to it, especially on these multi-day trips that you're doing. Um, <clears throat> do you find yourself ever um, participating in like shorter rides or races outside of um, messaging? I do not. Um, I had planned uh, uh, actually to take part on a, on a shorter race, like uh, which was 250k. That would be like 150 miles. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was the plan for April 11th, somewhere in the north of France, but obviously got postponed due to, uh, to the pandemic. Yep. But that's something that I'm 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 really uh, uh, willing to experiment with, uh, just you know to to have fun on the bike and, and uh, yeah try new stuff. Yeah, yeah. So you had planned on uh, racing the Highland Trail 550 this year, right? And then potentially the Tour Divide if you felt good after that. 
Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and so they canceled Highland Trail, and then obviously Tour Divide, it's kind of up in the air, but basically uh, it's probably not going to happen, at least the race yeah. start, um, which is pretty unfortunate. Um, what uh, what What's the draw for you to do the Highland Trail 550? Well, uh, I heard about it actually a couple of years ago uh, when you won it, and you <laughs> set the record. Yep. Okay. So that's when I heard about it. And uh, last year, I followed it really closely because I had several friends racing that year. I had uh, uh, so Clement that we talked about, yep. but also James Hyden, yep. um, and then other other guys that I do follow on a regular basis, like uh, Ben, ben Storbo from, uh, from Belgium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys like that. So I followed it really closely last year, and I was like, this is, this is epic. This is amazing. This is, I mean... And I just, I was just, I was just hooked. I just wanted to do it because it seems like so, so different, so hard and, and, and beautiful at the same time. And just, uh, I mean, I've never done it, but it looks like it's it's completely different from any other race that I that you do. Yeah, yeah, and I think it is for sure as far as like terrain is concerned. Having like a, a, a at least a. Uh, suspension fork or even a full suspension bike but there is plenty of road as well what bike would you what bomb track would you take on that on that route i would take uh i would take a mountain bike definitely yeah i would take a mountain bike with a with a suspension fork uh uh steel or uh, aluminum they do have an aluminum uh mountain bike coming up okay so that would have that would have been an option yeah but uh yeah not no so cross bike definitely suspension. Yeah, I mean, I talked I talked about it with uh, James Hyden, and uh, he, he recommended suspension, and I trust him. For sure, I would too, because you can really have a, a fun time on a, a suspension bike with uh, some of those descents because they're ripping. On a kind of a uh, more of a somber note, um, I know last year um, Alan, who runs the fi- uh, Highland Trail Five Fifty, he found um, a. Some sort of a, uh, what was it, a drug, a doping drug? I'm trying to remember the name of it right now. Um, But what are your thoughts on that? I just heard about that, and I was just, like, blown away. Whenever uh, I I have to to talk about doping, uh, it's because I, there's, I mean, there was, after, my uh, my run on the Tour Divide, some people actually doubting the fact that I was clean, the fact that I could go uh, three days without sleeping, uh, without using any drugs. I don't know what kind of drug you saw that I, I would use, like maybe methamphetamine or something like that. It's hard to defend yourself. Because yeah. what, what, what am I, what am I going to say? Right. But when I have to talk about this, I talk about, about the sport in general. And I've been in this sport for uh, uh, four years now. And I've raced with uh, some of the best. I know them. Uh, and I've, I've raced along them. I know guys like uh, James Hyden, obviously, Josh Cato, you, uh, uh, and Chris Blasco, for example, that I uh, that set the, the record for a single speed on the Tour de Bay. 2016. I know the top guys. I know them. And never in my mind is there a doubt that these guys are clean because they, we do this mm-hmm. first and foremost. We challenge ourselves. And there's no and there's no money to be won. And I felt like when I'm when I'm competing and the kind the kind of guys that I meet, we are all alike, you know. We we have the same way that we look at, at cycling, being out there, being being on the bike, being in the nature, and, and, and challenging ourselves, and, and and having just a ton of respect for each other. Yeah. And I mean, when you talk about doping, I just can't think of any one individual that is uh, uh, among the top riders in this sport that would do it. Just because of the kind of guys that that we are, and the kind of guys that the sport attracts, and I'm not saying that nobody's cheating. 
I know that definitely when you have a race with 200 people in there, there's going to be a few cheaters and there's going to be, I mean, we, uh, the, the year that I raced Trans Am, there was a guy that hitched the ride because he had a flat and then he didn't uh, go back to, to where he got picked up, stuff like yeah. that. So there's going to be cheaters. But what I think about doping in the sport of bikepacking right now is, is that it's not an issue. At least it's not an issue among the, the, the top riders, the guys, the guys that are out there to win. Because what would be the point? I mean, what? I mean, you go there, you win. There's no money in it. Right. You just, you just doing. I think we love it. We love the cycling too much. We love the, the we love the being out there, the challenge ourselves too much, and it's not our livelihood too. So there's no. I and mean, when you talk doping in professional cycling, I can, I can somehow. Uh, uh, see what happens you know like you're a young kid you get into a team you're pretty good and then you want to be pro and then you start you know climbing climbing the ladder and then at some point a uh, trainer tells you well kid uh, if you want to make it you, you you're gonna have to use something yeah and then you're like uh, well that's that's pretty much the only thing I know how to do I want to be a pro cyclist I don't have any plan B and and this is the life I chose, and then and then you start doing it, and then you get to into a team, and then it's your livelihood, and then some guys just says, well, if you don't do it, then you're gonna be out of a job, and then you're afraid of being out of a job, and then you just do it. So I'm, I mean, I can see how it happens in pro cycling, and I just don't see how it would transfer to to bike packing and the kind of people that do bike packing. Yeah. And just like the overall like idea of bikepacking and like you're riding all day, like does that actually help? Uh, whatever it would be, I yeah, I don't know. But yeah. Well that's super well stated, Sofian. Thank you. Yeah. Um and then kind of maybe a little bit on that same topic, um so there's a bunch of these road racers that are trying to do something different. What are your thoughts on them? Kind of joining in on doing races like the Tour Divide and and whatnot. That's 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 fairly interesting, actually. Uh, I was I was kind of always looking forward to this, and I was always kind of curious of how they would fare, mm -hmm. you know. And, and and I think it's just, it's just so different. The, the, it's two completely different games, and, and we saw it on the Atlas Mountain Race. Uh, there was a uh, um, uh, an ex-pro cyclist called Christian Mayer, who was legit with five Grand Tours and, and uh, national cyclocross champion in Canada. So oh, cool. real, real top-notch athlete. And he came to the Atlas Mountain Race, and he did really well for two days. Like, really well. We were, the two of us were leapfrogging mm -hmm. uh, at the, at, at the, for first position. And then he just, uh, he just... Uh, Gave up. He had he had troubles with the uh, with the uh, saddle sores and and uh, also his neck, I think. And he gave up. And but it was it was really interesting to see um, how fast this guy could. He was yeah. super fast. Like, They've got power. I, I, there is just, there is just a different kind of athlete. Like, yeah. It's just a different class. I mean, I, I'm 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 not too bad. I can climb. I yeah. mean, when I'm when you put me on my bike. And, and there's a long climb. I'm, I'm usually good, you know. But but this guy, it was so fast. I mean, I tried to keep up with the guy, and that's why I was like, okay, I can't, because if I if I keep going at this pace, I'm just, uh, I'm just gonna crash. Right. But then there's the speed, and pro cyclists they do have the speed, but then there's the there's the toughness, you know, and there's the experience, and then then. When you look at people like like Lel Wilcox or like me, people that have a, a bike touring background, there's a lot of stuff that we learn from bike touring that do apply mm -hmm. to bike packing, competitive bike packing. And there's there's you know some kind of resilience that you that you build on these longer rides. And I feel that maybe the 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 pain that you that you feel when you're a pro cyclist it's gonna last for i don't know 
how long is the stage? Like four or five, six hours is going to be really intense and really hard for four, four or five or six hours. And then it's going to be over and you're going to have a good meal and you're going to have a massage and then you're going to have a good bed and stuff like that. Whereas in bike packing, the, the, the pain and the discomfort, it just goes on and on and on. And it's not, it's maybe not, not as intense, but it never stops. And it's just, just a different way of experiencing discomfort and the different way of dealing with it and 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 i don't want to i don't want to uh, judge anyone or any decision or reaction but uh, some 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 people will will give up uh, uh because of injuries and some people will find a way to keep going with the injury some people will for example ride out of the saddle for two complete days just to finish you know and and some will just give up so it's it's just that the, the fitness the, the 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 kind of athlete that you are is important in bikepacking but it's definitely not as important as as pro cycling and the and the mental game the mental game is just so important especially I would say an off-road bike pack. That's yeah. just something that you, you, you cannot understand. Yeah. I think it'll be interesting over the next, like, five years, especially after this pandemic, like, what, you know, what wild hairs some, some cyclists kind of grow and try to jump into to the bike packing world and, and what, uh, you know, maybe if a handful of people want to just exit it all together. I don't know. I guess just in conclusion, um, what is, what's on tap for you this year? Obviously who knows what's going to, going to happen. So like, what are you, what's the daily, daily life with Sofian right now? What are you, what are you up to? Uh, so I'm, uh, out in the country, obviously. And, uh, I do, <laughs> I do stuff. <laughs> uh, really, really not uh, bike related because the, there's there's restric- restriction to what kind of cycling you can do when you you cannot go uh, more than uh, one kilometer away from your house. So I do like crosswords puzzles, uh, Scrabble. <laughs> then I, uh, I I chop wood, make fire, stuff like that. I go grocery shopping in uh, in a small farm where uh, with those local dudes and. Uh, I uh, I cook. Uh, I bake fishing, cakes. Fishing, right? Ah, uh, yeah. My, actually, my my girlfriend does the fishing. Okay. <laughs> and I'm kind of like, oh, can you? Are you gonna catch a finally catch a fish? <laughs> and so far, not, no, no, not yet. Are there fish but in those creeks? But there's there's trout. Yeah, yeah. There's trout. I mean, where is Josh Cato when you need yeah, it? Yeah, I know, right? Josh, yeah. if, you're, if you're looking at this. Please come and get me get me some fish. You need to, you need like to match the, the, the Yeah, it's like the best fly fisher out there. So uh, we, I need, I need you, Josh. Yeah. And yeah, that's that's pretty much uh, all I do. You know, just just you know, quiet, quiet country life. Cool. And uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough that that uh, the the farm where we do uh, buy the 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 fruit and veggies is about. Uh, ten miles from uh from our house, so we can uh we can ride uh you know twenty miles once in a while. Yeah. So that's nice. That's good. And then uh, when it's when this is gonna be uh when this is gonna be over, I don't I don't know what's gonna happen. I mean I mean obviously Tour de Vide is is, is uh uh probably as far as Grand Depart goes, probably not gonna happen. But but who knows? Maybe an ITT could be a possibility later in uh later in June or beginning of july that could be that could be an option yeah or uh, then we're gonna see what happens races in uh races in uh august september stuff like that october some races are getting postponed so maybe there's gonna be stuff happening at the end of the at the end of the season yeah Yeah. and the racing is gonna it's gonna start again and that would be nice yeah cool all right well, if you're doing an ITT, let me know. We can race to, ride together, race together. Yeah, that would be awesome. Man. <laughs> I, 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 d- I doubt it'll happen, but uh, yeah, yeah. It's, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. All right, so Fiona, well, thanks so much for joining us today, and um, we'll uh, we'll catch you next time. And yeah, my pleasure, Neil. It was awesome. Thanks, man.